Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. So I want to discuss an issue that may be sort of, I don't know, niggling in your brains here a little bit as far as uh, tangential um, surfaces, spaces on curves. All right. So we have tangent lines to curves, which we dealt with back when we were talking about Cartesian plane functions. And that was pretty easy to get our brains wrapped around, right? But when we start talking about surfaces in space, there may be something that's bothering you, kind of in the back of your mind. We, in the last section, we talked about what partial derivatives were and how they were created in their behavior. But when we talk about being tangential or being tangent to a, a curve in space, sometimes a line may feel very strange. So for example, I've got a little snippet of this guy right here, which is, by the way, this function, right? If I've got a function z equals f of x, y, where z has continuous partials, which just means I can take and it's partials, it just means I can take derivatives, partial derivatives of z everywhere, right, without having any jags or spikes or anything like that. All right, so we're going to start with this. So suppose I've got this guy. So in other words, take partials wherever you want, knock yourself out. Now, I grabbed a little snippet. So let's, let's just play. I don't want black. Give me blue. All right, let's say that we're talking about that point right there on the curve. Go away. That point right there on the curve. I could have a line that in the Cartesian definition is tangent to the curve. In, in other words, it only touches it in one place. But if I'm following this curvature, like don't assume that this has these little rectangles, right? Assume instead that it's perfectly, that it's smooth throughout. Well, there could be a line that does that, that passes through the point, that sort of describes the behavior of, say, an ant crawling on the surface as it was moving up this across this surface in that direction. Or why wouldn't that one work? Or why wouldn't that one work? Or why wouldn't that one work? And we knew from the partials, I could actually cut this along the x axis or along the y axis and get one of the lines that was tangential to this curve, right? We know how partials work now. So what may be bothering you is, wait a sec, th there's an uncountably infinite number of derivatives here. So if I've got an uncountably infinite number of derivatives, that means that the, the quote-unquote derivative in the classical Cartesian sense of the word, that's not even defined at that point, and therefore it wouldn't be defined at any of these points. So how do I deal with that? When I take, when I go from Cartesian space to space space, right, from R2 to R3, well, you probably are kind of getting by now that a line's not going to do it. If in two space we use a one-dimensional thing called a line to describe tangential behavior, what's your intuition say about three space? What should describe it? Well, the answer is, just as you would think, is a plane. And what we have is this tangential plane that's going to hold all of those lines. All of those lines will live in this plane. The best part is they're super easy, super easy, to calculate, it's amazing, it's frightening how easy it is. Not only are they easy to calculate, but all of the, the things that we did in two space, like differentials and linearizations of curves, we can generalize very easily to three space. All right, so let me show you what these things should look like, first and foremost. Over here, look at that bad boy. Just like we would expect, right? Kind of, kind of the same looking curve, and then there's our tangent plane to the curve. All right. And once I've got a tangent plane to the curve, I know that this, if I want to figure out tangents in x's and y directions on this curve, it's relatively easy to figure out. I can also figure out normals by doing things like cross products, things of that nature. All right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to give you the equation for this, which is, it, it, it's so simple, it's fabulous. It's very elegant. All right, here we go. I'm going to find the equation of the plane tangent. So we're going to find the plane tangent to f of x, y at some initial point, x naught, y naught, z naught. Right? Now, bear in mind, remember, we have equations of planes. We dealt with these, right? It's ax plus by plus cz 
plus an arbitrary constant, not an arbitrary constant, but a constant d equals zero. That's one way to put it. So if I want to figure this out, oh my god, it's so simple, it's fantastic. I simply go z minus z naught, right? I got my point. And this guy is going to be equal to the partial derivative of x at x naught y naught. Right? Remember how partials are done. I don't care about z, right? Because I fix a value, I plug it in, and uh, off I go. Times x minus x naught, just as you would expect, plus the partial of y at x naught y naught times y minus y naught, and I'm done. Isn't that amazing? It's so simple, and it makes total sense. What does this look like? Just, just take a second look at it. What's it look like? It looks like the point slope, only it's a three-point slope, and instead of taking regular derivatives, I'm taking partial derivatives, which totally makes sense, right? Because at this point, we're trying to find an equation of a plane where it contains these partial derivatives at the same time along the y and along the x. We want those partials contained in a plane that describes those incremental changes at those points. You gotta love it, right? Now, another cool ramification of this, which makes it super simple, is if you remember linearization. Remember linearization? And some people, we just hated it back in the day. Let me change, I'll do it with red to uh, reflect your ire. Remember it was L of X equaled, remember what this was? You took F of A plus F primed at A times x minus a, which we knew this to just be the equation of the line tangent, and then we would use the line to approximate a value somewhere down the road away from a. Remember we had an initial point, we had x equals a, we built this line, which if you look at it, it was just l of x equals mx plus b. That's m, right? Do you agree with that? I mean, I've got this little shift of a, that was no big deal. And then, actually, not even L of X equals MX plus B. It was, it was L of X minus F of A equals F prime of A times X minus A, which is just the point slope, right? And then I saw. Well, I can do exactly the same thing with this plane. That's the best part. Watch. I can simply solve for Z. So remember, Z equals F of X, Y. So I can use this tangent plane to approximate any other values away from this point of tangency, just like I use the linearization, the, the tangent line, to approximate values of the function away from the point of tangency. So I simply write this as the partial with respect to x, x naught, y naught. And I know it's hard to do it symbolically, and we're going to do a bunch of these problems. So please don't worry about that. Again, just remember that we are, oops, sorry. We're just getting formulas squared away in the videos, and then we'll, might as well not, do a bunch of them in class. And this is going to be plus z naught. And guess what? That is my linearization. I always forget how to, read, to write this linear. Is it two ends? And it works the exact same way, but in three space, which is amazing. And like I said, we'll do a bunch of these in class. I'm just trying to get you the formulas so you don't get crazy. Now, let's make sure we really understand what this means graphically. So I, I grabbed another little snagit here. Oops, let me get out of this. All right, look at this guy. So different curve, but this is hopefully this helps you to visualize the, the um, tangent plane. Let's go red. Looks pretty good. All right, so here's my point of tangency, okay? And as you can tell, this is my x, y plane, but let's, let's keep it simpler. Assume that this thing is lower, so we're not looking at this point. That's kind of like z equals zero. So I want z to be a little bit bigger. It doesn't really matter, to be honest with you. Well, if I look at my equation over here, what does this say? What it says is, okay, it gives me or the linearization uh, equation. I want to make sure we're looking at this bad boy. What it says is, if I change x and y at the same time, I can use this plane that, think about it this way. It drifts this point on the plane away from the initial 
um, point of tangency, but I can use that plane to approximate the value of this z curve in space. Just like, remember, when we re remember when we had these linearizations in two space, I can use the line to approximate the curve, only now I can use the plane to appro approximate the curve in three space. As long as I stay relatively close to that point of tangency or I get super lucky in terms of the behavior of the curve. Now, this leads actually to a pretty profound, the linearization equation, it actually leads to a relatively profound um, a consequence and it gives us the ability to describe when z equals f of xy is actually differentiable. So this linearization equation just flows right into differentiability of a space. So we say z is differentiable, is diffable -able at a comma b if and only if Delta Z, now this is a crazy equation, it's straight out of your textbooks, but it's also very commonly written like this, can be written as the partial derivative of F, remember F is just at, um, uh, Z, at AB times delta X plus the partial of Y at AB times delta y. Now here's where it kind of all hell breaks loose as far as the, the, the notation, and this gets a little confusing. Plus epsilon 1 delta x. Now don't be afraid of epsilons. They mean exactly the same thing in this context as they did before. If you, rem if you recall from calc 1, uh, epsilon 2 delta y. Now look at this. This chunk right here sort of looks like it should correspond to this guy right here. But look at what look at what this says. Now, there's a little bit more that I want to add to this first. I, we, we, for this to be differentiable, then we know that delta z can be written in this form, but we have to add a little bit more. This is where epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 head to 0 as delta x and delta y also go to 0 delta x, delta y, head to zero, right? I write this thing as, as an ordered pair. Now, okay, let's, let's just get our brain wrapped around what this really means, right? Because there's actually a far more mnemonic definition of what differentiability means for a function. And, and I'm gonna write that right now, and then let's see if we can sort of peel back and look at this and see if it makes sense. It says, this is actually, this is a definition, and this is a theorem. And the theorem says, if the partial derivatives, if the partials, I get lazy with this, f sub x, f sub y, exist near the point of tangency, a, b, all right, and are continuous continuous at AB, this implies that F, whoa, I don't know where that F came from, is diffable, diffable at AB. And then we can extend that to F being diffable everywhere if this is true for every um, point in the domain, in the plane in the Cartesian plane x, y, where we're grabbing our a, b's from. Remember, we grab a, b from, from r squared. All right, so let's, let's read over this guy, and then let's see if it, why this definition leads to this theorem. If the partials f, x, y, or the f, x, and f, y exist near a, b, and are continuous, so if they are close to it. Now, what does that mean? That really means that the linearization, the linearization, works relatively or arbitrarily close to AB, right? Because we built this linearization based on the partials. So if the derivatives exist, the partials exist close to AB, arbitrarily so, and are continuous. In other words, I can actually take them at AB. If I can't take them at AB, this entire thing falls apart. Then that implies that F is difficult at AB, which means the linearization works. If the linearization works, then the, the curve itself has to be differentiable. And I know that that feels a little bit circular, but 
if you really dig down into it, just look at the theorem. That basically is, is what it, what's got to happen. I got to have these partials working arbitrarily close to AB and the derivative to actually exist at AB. Otherwise, this, this equation falls apart. And then this is just sort of, it talks about this change in Z using the linearization to approximate the change. And then this, this notation right here should feel familiar. As I shrink delta X and delta Y, then this epsilon, these little epsilon changes in X and Y should shrink to zero as well. It, it's, yeah, I know. This notation makes my head spin too from time to time. All right, so anyway, now at least we have our definition um, of, of differentiability of z equals f of x, y. Now hopefully you remember linearization from calculus 1. And hopefully you remember that there was something that followed that was in the same section in two space in the Cartesian plane called differentials. It was in the same section, differentials, and it was actually more elegant than the linearization. If you recall, dy over dx equaled f primed of x. And that led algebraically to dy equaled f primed of x times dx, which, if you look closely, it was just an algebraic separation of the derivative, and out pop this guy. Right? Remember how this guy worked? If we wanted to figure out the overall change in y based on a change in x, we just took the change in x, we multiplied the derivative at the or multiply it by the derivative taken at some value x equals a. And then dx represented some a uh, like delta a, right? You know what I mean. <laughs> some change in that value, delta x. Okay? I guess I shouldn't write it as delta a, that's stupid. Let's write it as delta x. So what? Um, I can build that just as easily in 3-space. I'm going to write dz is equal to, I'm going to take the partial with respect to x, and I'm going to take that at, this is the general solution, at x, y, okay, and I'm going to multiply that times dx, all right, that's going to actually be a hard dx, it's not a partial dx, and this is going to be a hard dz, it's not going to be a partial dz, because we're looking for actual changes. All right, and then I'm going to add to that the partial with respect to y at the point x comma y times dy. I, it, it falls right out. That's what partial derivatives give us. They give us the ability to build these really cool um, equations that we can then use. Now, if you look really close, if I think about this as delta z and this as delta x, and this is delta y, right? Then look over here, here. Look at this equation of the tangent plane. This is just a restatement of this. z minus z naught, if I have values for an, an initial point, x naught, y naught, z naught, and I move that over incrementally to another one, and I take the difference, that's delta z. This guy's delta x, this guy's delta y, and then I'm taking my values at some point x comma y. Now I'm going to do an example with you right now because I do want to do an example here rather than in class just so you can see it. Okay, here we go. So I've got z equals f of x, y. You don't have to write this every time, but it's nice to. Let's do x squared plus 3xy minus y squared. All right, and I'm going to find the differential. So I've got dz is equal to, now how's it work? Take the partial with respect to x, which gives me 2x plus 3y. That guy disappears, and this is going to be times dx. This is going to be plus the partial with respect to y, so this term disappears. I get 3x minus 2y, and then I multiply that times dy. There's my differential. That's easy enough. Now, let's suppose for a second that I've got xy, my initial point, or I could call it ab, is equal to 2, 3. All right, and I'm going to use, I'm going to change this to, let's go 2.05 comma 2.96, all right? So again, I'm using the plane. you got to think about this. This all comes from that plane. I'm, I'm going to take 
these guys and project it onto the plane rather than onto the curve itself. And then I'm going to approximate dz with that information, and then I'm actually going to find the change in z using a calculator to determine how close I am to the real value. But remember, the whole purpose of differentials was that they were quick. They were super snappy and super quick. And as I, I'm apt to say, close enough for government work. You know what I mean? All right, so let's see what this is. I've got dz is going to equal, I'm going to have, now, what do I plug in here? What do I stick in? Well, this is x and y, and this is delta x, or d, excuse me, dx. So I'm actually starting with my original x and y. So this is going to be 2 times 2 plus 3 times 3 times, now what's the change in x? That's easy enough, 0 0.05, right? Plus 3 times 2, which is 6, minus 2 times 3, which is 0, oh, that's comfy, and this is times point, what, negative, right? I, it, I am moving left, or excuse me, I guess I'm moving down, if we're thinking of it in the Cartesian space, negative 0.04, all right? Wait, why did I get that zero? Sorry, this should be six. I got ahead of myself, didn't I? This is six minus six. So this just turns into, turns into, what do we got here? Four plus nine, that's 13 times 0 0.05, plus zero times who cares, but in this case it's negative, who cares? It's negative 0 0.04, and this is what? 0 0.65. So that's my change in z. That's my approximate change in z, right? Remember how differentials work. If I want the actual change in z, then what do I have to do? Well, I have to take z of, what do I do? Well, I'm going to have to go, let's see, change in z. Where, where are my points? There are my points right there. I'm going to take z of 2.05, comma, 2.96, and then I'm going to have to subtract z of 2, comma, 3 from that. And what do I get? Well, I'm going to sort of cook this thing up. What I end up with is approximately, you could plug it in, but I've got it in my calculator, so I'm being a little bit lazy, 0. 0.66449. Look at that. That's pretty good, right? Close enough for government work. But notice, we're talking about incrementally small changes, just like we were talking about them in two space. I hope you're starting to appreciate the theme, particularly with these topics, with functions of multiple variables. All we're doing is generalizing from the plane into space. Now, there are some marked changes that happen in that generalization, like lines become planes. That's a far more complicated thing to deal with than just a line. However, if you can get in that space and you're confident with your, with your calculus 1 and your calculus 2, this part of Calculus 3 in particular, it should be pretty straightforward to. It's just formulaic. All right, thanks for your time and attention. Thanks for listening, and I'll, uh, I'll see you.